So in this question, we are asked to find the maximum value of a function on a closed interval. Notice our closed interval is from a left endpoint of 0 to a right endpoint of 1. Because we have a closed interval and we are asked to find the maximum value, we are going to use the closed interval method. In this method, the first thing we need to do is to find the values of the function at the critical numbers. Now let's remember that a critical number in this context would be a number where the derivative of this function is equal to zero. So what that means is that we have to compute the derivative of our function and set it equal to zero. Let's take a look at how we could do that. Now what we actually have is the product of two functions. We have x to the power of a multiplied by 1 minus x to the power of b. And because we have a product of two functions, we need to use the product rule. In the product rule, you can simply let f equal your first function. So in this case, f is equal to x to the power of a. g is going to equal the second function, 1 minus x to the power of b. We will also need the derivative of these functions. Now the question noted that a and b are positive numbers, so that means that when we do our derivatives, we're gonna use some power and chain rules. So for example, for f prime, we have a power rule. We simply drag a into the front, so to speak. We have a times x to the power of a minus one. Remember, we subtract one from the original power. For g prime, we have to be careful. We have to use a chain rule along with the power rule. So it's a little bit similar. We drag b into the front. We recopy the inner function. We subtract one from the original power, but then chain rule kicks in here, requiring us to multiply by the derivative of the inside. We have one minus x, so the derivative would be zero minus one, which of course is just a negative one. So there is the derivative of g. We now plug it into the power rule equation. And I like to call this equation fig plus gif. It's just a little mnemonic that you can use to help you with the product rule. And so here we go, we're doing f prime of x and we follow our little equation. So f prime is a times x to the power of a minus one times our g, which was one minus x to the power of b plus our g prime. Now, be a little bit careful here because we do have a plus sign, but we're also multiplying g prime by a negative one. So that actually makes g prime overall negative. And since you're adding a negative, you would actually be subtracting. So you can write minus b times one minus x to the power of b minus one. And then we finish off by multiplying by f, which was x to the power of a. So that is our derivative, admittedly a little bit uh, ugly, I would say. We have to take that derivative and we have to set that equal to zero and try to solve this for x. And this will be an interesting experience. So hopefully we can find a greatest common factor. For example, if we look at x to the power of a, we have, well, x to the power of a minus one and then x to the power of a right here. And one rule of thumb for factoring out a power of a is to factor out the smaller power. Now, if you look carefully, the smaller power would be the a minus one. So you're going to factor out an x to the power of a minus one. In addition, we have some powers of b. We have a power of b here and a power of b minus one. Again, you wanna factor out the smallest of those powers, which would be the b minus one. So we will write one minus x to the power of b minus one. Now, figuring out what remains can be a little bit tricky. And one thing you could do is go back to the original expression and divide it by the GCF. So we're gonna divide the first term by x to the a minus one times one minus x to the b minus one, and then divide the second term by the same thing, x to the power of a minus one times one minus x to the b minus one. Again, it gets a little tricky here, but let's go back to the first term. You can see that when we divide the x to the a minus one and the x to the a minus one right there would cancel. As for this term right here, remember that when you divide, you're subtracting the powers. So you're subtracting b and b minus one. You can do that off on the side. When you subtract b and b minus one, don't forget to put the b minus one in parentheses. You would distribute that minus sign you would get b minus b plus one, which of course is just one. So when subtracting the powers, we end up with just a positive one. And therefore, what we're left with in the first term is the a times the one minus x to the power of one. Let's go to the second term. We have that minus sign. The one minus x to the power of b minus one will cancel. 
And then again, when you divide x to the a by x to the a minus 1, you subtract the powers, it'll work the same way as before. You're going to end up with x to the power of 1. So therefore, we have b multiplied by x to the power of 1. And now what we would probably want to do is distribute the a into the little parentheses there. So now we'll just have a minus ax minus bx in the brackets. Okay, so this is still set equal to zero. We have three factors here, and we want to set each one of those factors equal to zero. Now, it's interesting because in the first factor, you have x to the power of a minus 1 is equal to 0. And to solve that, you could take the natural log of both sides. Remember, we want to try to solve for x. But if we take the natural log on both sides, we would end up with the natural log of 0 right there. And that does not exist. So we're not going to get a solution for that first factor. Same kind of ball game over here. We would take the second factor. We would say 1 minus x to the power of b minus 1 is equal to 0. And to solve for x, we'd have to take the natural log of both sides, but we would end up with the natural log of 0 on the right side. There's no solution in that case either. So we look to the third factor. We set it equal to 0. And we would like to solve this for x. And perhaps one way of doing that would be to add ax as well as bx to both sides. So what you're doing there is you're trying to isolate your terms that contain x. The left side, after some canceling, would just be a, and on this side we have ax plus bx. Now that you've isolated the terms containing x, you would factor out the x. So factor out that x, and then your other factor would be a plus b. And then, of course, if you divide both sides of this by a plus b, you will get a solution here for x. So we can see that our critical number and that is the number we get when setting the derivative equal to zero. Our critical number is a divided by a plus b. But we're not yet done with step one, because step one required us to evaluate the function at that critical number. So brace yourselves, because we're going to have to plug this critical number into the original function. So there's the original function, and we're going to take this critical number, and we're going to plug it in. Remember, you're plugging it in for x, so let's go ahead and do that. So we have f of a over a plus b. We plug it in for x. This gives us a divided by quantity a plus b, all raised to the power of a. Over here, we have 1 minus, and again, we plug in the a over a plus b, and this is all raised to the power of b. Now you could leave it in that form, but we could probably tidy it up just a little bit. Perhaps we can begin by distributing this power of a. So this a will be distributed to the numerator and distributed to the denominator. That would give you a to the power of a over quantity a plus b also to the power of a. So that's pretty nice. And then over here, we want to find a common denominator. So what that means is you want to rewrite the 1 as a plus b over a plus b. Notice that is still equivalent to 1. Any quantity divided by itself equals 1. And then we have minus the other term. And now we have a common denominator inside the parentheses. And of course, once you have a common denominator, you can combine the two fractions. So you would have a plus b minus a, all divided by a plus b. This is still to the power of b. And then after combining the fractions, we have a minus a, which goes to 0. So in fact, that second term there is just b not sure what happened there. It's just b over a plus b to the power of b. You would then distribute that b to the numerator and to the denominator. So we're doing a couple of steps at once here, but you would end up with b to the power of b over quantity a plus b to the power of b. Let's situate that next to our other term. And we can continue simplifying this, making it look a little bit tidier. We can multiply our numerators. This would be a to the a times b to the b. And then when we multiply the denominators, notice they have the same base. They have a base of a plus b. Remember that when you multiply exponentials that have a common base, you would add those two powers. So you would be left with a plus b to the power of a plus b. How nifty is that? So this is the value of our function at the critical number. So remember, we just computed f of a over a plus b. This completes the closed interval method. Let's take a look at step two of that method. 
which tells us to find the values of our function at the end points of the interval. Now, recall the end points were 0 and 1, so step 2 requires us to plug those into the original function. So we'll begin with f of 0. This would be 0 to the power of a and then 1 minus 0 to the power of b. We get 0 to the a multiplied by 1 to the b. 0 to any power is 0, so this ends up just equaling 0. We then plug in the other end point, which is 1, so we'll have 1 to the power of a times 1 minus 1 to the power of b. This gives us 1 to the a times 0 to the b. Same outcome as before. We end up with a result of 0. So that completes step 2. And in step 3, we're going to compare those results with the result we obtained earlier when we plugged in the critical number and had gotten the following result right here. And so now we look at the contents of step three here. And step three says that the largest of the values from steps one and two is the absolute maximum value. Take a look at your values here. You have zero, zero, and then this quantity. Now this is a little abstract, but remember A and B are positive numbers. So this entire quantity is positive. And so ask yourself, which of these three quantities is the largest value? And of course it would have to be this. So this value right here, which is of course greater than zero, this will be our absolute maximum value on the given interval. And then the smallest of the three values is the absolute minimum. So there's sort of a tie here, and therefore we could just pick one of them. Zero is going to be the absolute minimum value of our function on the given interval. And so this completes the analysis of this question.